Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited to address you this afternoon. And thank you very much indeed, uh, Colonel Treese, for those uh, kind remarks. Uh, it's perfectly true uh, that my book got to number two on the bestseller list, beaten only by a book about Michael Jackson. Uh, <laughs> in the course of... Um, writing The Storm of War and its uh, predecessor, Masters and Commanders, it became very clear to me that the primary reason why the Germans lost the Second World War, a war that they could have won, is that Adolf Hitler, whenever the best interests of the Nazi party bifurcated from those of the Wehrmacht, always took the former route. He always prioritized his fascism, his Nazism, over and above the best interests of the German Reich. He also saw the Second World War entirely in ideological terms, rather than in the grand strategic terms that an earlier German leader such as Bismarck or an earlier chief of staff such as uh, Helmut von Moltke would have done. And you see this happening so often. It's so ubiquitous in the key decision-making moments of the Second World War as to be a pattern for his war fighting and an explanation for his defeat. Right at the beginning of the war, at the time of Operation Sea Lion, the, uh, the projected German invasion of Britain in 1940, Hitler had only 43 operational U-boats, as against 463 at the time of the end of the Second World War in May 19, at least in uh, the war in Europe in May 1945. Had he had 463 U-boats at the beginning of the war, had he started to build his U-boat capacity from the moment he came to power in January 1933, he would have been able to have strangled uh, Great Britain right off at the beginning of the war, but he never thought it was necessary, never thought it would be necessary for one Anglo-Saxon nation to fight against another Anglo-Saxon nation, even though, of course, he himself had fought in the Great War across the uh, no man's land from British regiments. This was uh, a classic example of his uh, of placing his Nazism, his, uh, his belief in the uh, importance, the vital center of importance of race as opposed to any of the other major considerations uh, necessary. He um, didn't even work out what would happen were he to need to invade Britain. The various plans for the invasion of Britain, Operation Sea Lion, were still being, uh, still being perfected at the time of the Battle of Britain and afterwards. Um, when there was, at that point, after the defeat in the Battle of Britain, Hitler had no uh, realistic chance of invading. This got to the point that when the SS drew up a list of 2,820 uh, Britons who were going to be arrested and uh, shot on sight, the list was uh, so haphazard and uh, last minute that it included Sigmund Freud, who had died two years beforehand. Uh, it had Aldous Huxley, who had come to live in America in 1936. And when uh, the whole list was published in, um, uh, after the end of the war, once it was captured, Dame Rebecca West telegraphed to Noel Coward, both of them appeared on the list, saying, my dear, the people we should have been seen dead with. <laughs> on the 25th of August, 1940, a lone Heinkel 111 bomber which had, in fact, got lost from the uh, rest of its uh, squadron, dropped some bombs on the east end of London. Winston Churchill used this opportunity to, uh, the very next night, respond with an all-out attack on Berlin. This was at the height of the, uh, of the Battle of Britain, at a time when the Royal Air Force was absolutely on its last legs. Uh, the command and control systems had been blown to smithereens, the holes in the runways uh, and, uh, and the ability to, for uh, RAF squadrons to take off were deeply damaged. The uh, RAF was absolutely um, 
within days of being operationally incapable of continuing to defend Britain. And yet, instead of keeping to this, uh, to this uh, Luftwaffe plan to, uh, to destroy the, airway, uh, the, um, the aerodromes, Hitler, again, entirely due to ideology, uh, ideology, owing to the fact that he had promised the German people that no bomber would ever get through to bomb Berlin. This went totally against his concept, the Nazi concept of the Führer principle, that uh, the Führer was infallible. And he had been proved to be fallible by uh, Churchill's immediate response to this lone 111 bomber. And so he, on the 7th of September, turned the Luftwaffe attack from the aerodromes to the bombing of London, to the civilian bombing, the East End bombing, trying to knock out the British docks. And this ladies and gentlemen, gave the RAF the absolutely crucial time that it needed in order to fill the holes in the runway, to repair the command and control systems, and to put ourselves in a position to win the Battle of Britain by the 15th of September. Again, ideology. You see in the three central reasons for Hitler's invasion of Russia um, on the 22nd of June 1941. Ideology trump general uh, and grand strategy every time. The first was to build Lebensraum, living space in the east uh, for the German um, Übermensch, the, uh, the uh, Superman. And this was intended to grab uh, hundreds of thousands of square miles of territory in Eastern Europe and um, use it for uh, the German Reich and for it to be, act for, the, for the work to be done by the Untermensch, the subhuman Slavs, who Hitler believed he was going to be able to destroy in quick order. Again, racial ideology as the primary motivating uh, factor. But the other two factors were also had very little to do with, indeed nothing to do with grand strategy. Um, the political one, of course, was for his desire to win um, a, uh, the, what he called the final struggle against the Bolsheviks. Ever since the 1920s, he had been a street fighter against Bolshevism. He wanted what he, called, what he told Goebbels would be the final reckoning against the Bolsheviks. When we kick in the door, he says, uh, the whole rotten edifice will collapse. And um, again, this was not uh, driven by strategy. This was driven by a, by a political loathing. And also, of course, uh, in 1941, over half of Europe's Jews lived in the USSR, and he wanted to have uh, a chance to have a final solution, of, uh, an opportunity to destroy them. And so these three great driving forces behind what uh, was and, uh, and uh, presumably um, always will be the, uh, the biggest invasion in world history. Over three million men crossed the uh, Russian border in 1941, in June 1941. Uh, 186 divisions in all were, uh, were uh, flung into Operation Barbarossa. And uh, it was not thought out properly in the strategic sense. The uh, initial um, victories were astonishing. Indeed, on the first day of Barbarossa, on the 22nd of June, no less than 40% of the Red Bomber Force, the uh, USSR's bomber force, was destroyed on the ground. Didn't even have a chance to take off. Uh, its commander, Lieutenant uh, General Ivan Kopetz, shot himself um, that afternoon, which uh, in Stalin's Russia was a sensible career move. What um, happened next was a serial uh, refusal on the behalf of the Führer to take advice from generals who were far more strategically um, impressive, uh, far, far better strategic thinkers than, uh, than he. Um, people who had, of course, gone to staff college, who had learned about strategy, who had fought as officers as opposed to uh, non-commissioned officers in the Great War. 
Uh, men like Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian and Eric von Manstein and Gerd Rundstedt. He would listen to these people. We know, uh, we know how long he would listen to them, sometimes up to an hour. He would listen to these, uh, to these generals. Um, we know because from the December of 1942, uh, right the way through to the end of the war, uh, and his death in April 1945, we have the verbatim accounts of the uh, Führer conferences taking place in uh, most of them in the Wolfschanze in uh, eastern Prussia. Um, it's still there. You can go to visit it in, uh, in mo what is modern-day Poland, a, a fabulously uh, fascinating, sinister place, uh, including the uh, remains of the hut that they uh, attempted to kill him in on the 20th of July, 1944. And he spent over half of the war at the Wolfschanze, and we know every word that was said at the meetings. And uh, so we know that, yes, he would listen to Guderian and, and Rommel and others, but he would um, then, at the end of the meeting, uh, decide to do precisely what he'd intended to do right at the beginning of the meeting. He was a... Um, uh, he, he, had, he would... He admired his generals until, of course, in July they, 44, they tried to blow him up. Um, but he uh, would constantly be moving them around from different theatres. Uh, Myrtle had to take command in the calendar year 1944. Myrtle had to take command of the Army Group North, Army Group Centre, and Army Group South. Uh, at different stages. He would move, uh, he moved Rundstedt uh, backwards and forwards, sacking him three times in the course of the Second World War. Guderian was effectively sacked uh, as well at one point, uh, and Rommel, of course, was forced to commit suicide. These, uh, these men had, um, uh, were, were never certain that they were going to stay in the job for very long um, because he could never keep the same um, general in place. It, was, uh, it went against his nature. The idea that Adolf Hitler had as um, his propagandists, uh, such as um, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, his Minister for Culture and Public Enlightenment, told the German peoples he had a will of iron. He didn't at all. Hitler would constantly change his mind in some very important aspects, uh, such as the... Um, uh, the jet aircraft, the, uh, which he turned from being a fighter to a bomber and back to a uh, fighter again. He actually created industrial bottlenecks through his changes of mind that turned out to be uh, disastrous. Um, he was also, again, b because of his ideology, um, completely incapable when it came to the, uh, the turn of the war in the autumn of uh, 1942, uh, totally incapable of seeing strategic withdrawals in anything other than a political sense. He assumed that because this uh, great, um, uh, this great uh, um, drive across Europe had been so successful in 1939 to 1941, that, that the German people if they saw any strategic withdrawals, would um, consider that to be the equivalent of, uh, of defeat. And yet the Germans were superb at strategic withdrawals when they were allowed to do it. The only drawback was that he constantly refused the generals the right to. We were always taught as historians, now at least I was at uh, university, never to use the word inevitable, because uh, nothing is inevitable in history. Um, and that's true. Uh, except for German counterattack. Uh, <laughs> German counterattack, when one looks at Kazarine Pass, when one looks at Caen, when one looks at Anzio, when one looks at Salerno, when one looks at the, the Battle of the Bulge, the classic example of this, a 39 divisional attack coming out of the Ardennes uh, forests and mountains. Um, conducted in the uh, dead of night through three feet of snow with searchlights bounced across against the, um, against the uh, clouds to turn uh, night into day, with messages only being um, handed out by motorcyclists and never by radio. It was an astonishing uh, counterattack, almost got to the Meuse River. Uh, that is the capacity for the Germans for counterattack. And, uh, and yet, um, 
Hitler consistently hobbled the uh, high command in their attempts to, um, uh, to undertake them. Uh, he would also, as the war progressed, and especially, of course, after the uh, bomb plot, appoint generals on the basis of their political loyalty uh, to him personally and their Nazism, rather than on their capability as, uh, as generals. You see this with uh, Schoener, with Rendelich, with Krebs, various uh, ger German generals who, uh, frankly, weren't um, top-class um, soldiers, but were fanatical Nazis. And he would appoint them sooner than the, um, the less political uh, but better soldiers. Another example, as I say, say of, uh, of ideology trumping um, the best interests of the Wehrmacht. You also see it in the uh, Operation Barbarossa with the way in which he treated the Baltics and the Ukraine. The Ukraine is a classic example of a part of the Soviet Union which loathed the Bolsheviks in Moscow, understandably so, as uh, something like two million Ukrainians had been deliberately starved to death in the, uh, in the Great Famine of the, the artificial Great Famine of the late 1920s, early 1930s by the Bolsheviks. And yet, um, he could not, he constitutionally could not allow genuine Slavic autonomy. When the um, Wehrmacht rolled into uh, Ukrainian villages, the elders came out with their traditional uh, welcome of bread and salt. Um, he, he, had he turned the Ukraine against the um, against the Moscow government, then pretty much anything might have been possible in the um, Operation Barbarossa, but he could not genuinely do that. He couldn't give genuine autonomy to the, uh, to the Slavic Untermensch. He had to see it in terms of um, ideology. And so you come to the um, horrific moment, of course, in the winter of 1940, uh, two, I'm so sorry, 1941, when the w Russian winter closes in. And the assumption that had been made, um, again on ideological grounds, that the Soviet Union would collapse uh, after the door had been kicked in, that after only a five-month ma campaign, Russia would um, be uh, flung out of Moscow, that Leningrad would fall, um, was put to the test. And because of this over this assumption of victory, uh, rather than the long war, you had the situation where um, German soldiers were not properly provided for when it came to winter clothing. And the results I, um, I mention in, uh, in my book, always display the product. <laughs> um, there was an Italian journalist called Curzio Malaparte, who, in his um, autobiographical book um, called Caput, refers to the time when he was waiting in the, um, in the Europeska Cafe in Warsaw. It's still there, in fact. It's just across the road from the railway station. And, um, and he started seeing the, uh, the German wounded coming off the, um, coming off the uh, trains. And um, before I read to you about what uh, that was like, here's a quotation from Hitler um, on the 12th of August, 1942. He was having dinner with um, the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, at the Berchtesgaden um, at, uh, on that day. And um, they were talking about how, how cold Russian winters could get. And he said this, having to change into long trousers was always a misery to me. He was boasting about how, um, how uh, great he was in the, uh, and how hardy he was in the cold, and arguing also that his, uh, his army could be just as hardy. Having to change into long trousers was always a misery to me. Even with a temperature of 10 below zero, I used to go about in lederhosen. The feeling of freedom they give you is wonderful. Uh, abandoning my shorts was one of the biggest sacrifices I had to make. Anything up to five degrees below zero, I didn't even notice. Quite a number of young people of today already wear shorts all the year round. It's just a question of habit. 
In the future, I shall have an SS Highland Brigade in Lederhosen. Uh, of course, it wasn't minus five uh, or minus ten. Some, including the wind chill factor, the, um, the weather got down to minus 30 degrees. And, uh, and the result was that Curzio Malaparty saw this um, as he's sitting in the cafe watching the troops come off the train. Suddenly, I was struck with horror and realized that they had no eyelids. I'd already seen soldiers with lidless eyes on the platform of the Minsk station a few days earlier on my way from Smolensk. The ghastly cold of that winter had the strangest consequences. Thousands and thousands of soldiers had lost their limbs. Thousands and thousands had their ears, their noses, their fingers, and their sexual organs ripped off by the frost. Many had lost their hair. Many had lost their eyelids. Singed by the cold, the eyelid drops off like a piece of dead skin, and their future was only lunacy. When it comes to the explanation for Hitler's other classic, massive blunder, um, his decision to go to war against you on the 11th of December 1941, to declare war against an uninvadable country, you see there, too, the influence of ideology over any kind of, um, of um, uh, grand strategic sense. His assumption, of course, was that having been attacked four days earlier at Pearl Harbor, the entire might of the United States Army was going to, Army, Navy, and Air Force were going to uh, be concentrated against the, uh, against the Japanese first. He had no inkling uh, of the, what for me, represents the most far-sighted strategic decision of the 20th century, which was that of um, General Marshall, uh, and the Roosevelt administration, and of course, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, to put Germany first. Uh, the Germany first policy, which was um, the very, which was the fundamental framework for um, American uh, victory over the fascist powers in the uh, Second World War, in my view. Um, what instead he based his assumptions were, was the, uh, idea that because he believed that America was ruled by blacks and Jews, that therefore they would not be able to, uh, to fight successfully in the Second World War. Quite apart from the fact that he obviously hadn't studied the personnel of the Roosevelt administration, um, it uh, made absolutely no sense constantly to underplay the uh, abilities of the Americans to fight, not least because he himself, as a uh, as a corporal in the trenches of the Bavarian, 16th Bavarian List Regiment in the Great War, had been um, across no man's land from American divisions. So he was, he was putting his ideology before the actual experience of his own, um, of his own life, an astonishing concept. None of, the, uh, none of the senior Nazis knew America. The only single one of them that had ever come here uh, was Joachim von Ribbentrop, who in the 1920s had attempted to sell unsuccessfully uh, champagne in New York. Uh, that, was the, uh, that, that was the entire extent of the Nazis' personal knowledge of America. And so when um, Ribbentrop talked about America, he listened to, uh, they, they, they listened to him, um, even Hitler. And this is what he told a delegation of Italians in 1942. He said this about America, I know them, I know their country, a country devoid of culture, devoid of music, above all, a country without soldiers, a people who will never be able to decide the war from the air. When has a Jewified nation like that ever become a race of fighters and flying aces? And Hitler himself um, told Molotov in 1940 that the earliest that the Americans would be able to um, deploy any serious amount of troops in the Western theater would be in the year 1970. Uh, <laughs> as it was, needless to say, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell any of you that uh, by November 1942, under Operation Torch, uh, you had landed a quarter of a million men in the North African um, uh, theater, and then, of course, were going to go on in July 1943 to Sicily, then across the Straits in September 1943 to Italy, uh, and then the day after taking Rome, you were going to cross the Channel with, uh, with massive preponderant forces, uh, the, another 
central statistic for me of the Second World War is that in the calendar year 1944, and this is something the Nazis could, could never get their mind around because they never truly appreciated the massive productive power of the United States. In the calendar year 1944, when Britain produced 28,000 warplanes and Germany and Russia produced 40,000 warplanes each, the United States produced no fewer than 98,000 warplanes, as much as the whole of the rest of the world put together effectively. And uh, so this was something that, uh, that, they were, um, that the Nazis were, for ideological reasons, incapable of understanding. The um, non-Nazis perfectly well understood. Uh, you had, the, um, uh, had serious uh, and substantial figures in the uh, German war production uh, ministries, uh, including Albert Speer, who uh, did understand that if America was to, as Roosevelt made sure he did in the State of the Union address of um, January 1942, turn the entire productive, peacetime productive um, capacity of the United States into a wartime military uh, capacity, then anything was possible. In fact, you had one person in one of the German ministries shoot himself uh, as soon as he heard that America had, uh, had entered the war, because he knew that it, the, effectively the game was up. In the great attack on Russia, the Barbarossa attack, um, which took place in June 1941, um, which of course was in, entirely came from the uh, from the West. Had Hitler managed to coordinate with Japan, and had Japan managed to attack from the East, it was in a percent, uh, position to from Manchuria. Had they moved into Siberia at that time, uh, then it would have been impossible for the uh, for the Russians to have defended Moscow. On the 18th of October 1941, Stalin made his personal train ready to take him bit back beyond the Urals um, to, uh, to Yekaterinburg. And uh, had it not been for the 16 Siberian divisions that were taken from beyond the Urals to defend Moscow in that uh, key moment in mid-October mid 1941, um, then the demoralization of the Soviet Union would have been uh, incalculable if they had learned that Stalin had left Moscow. When one thinks in the north, the Nazis, the Germans, subjected Leningrad to a grueling 850 long day, day long siege. 850 days, which cost a total of 1.1 million soldiers and civilians, uh, but nonetheless held out. And then down in uh, Stalingrad in the uh, south, um, which is somewhere that I hugely recommend uh, you to go to, the modern-day Volgograd, an immensely moving place where some of the buildings that they have that were fought over, the old uh, tractor factories that were fought over in Stalingrad, where there are, there's literally a bullet in every single brick uh, of, these, um, of these buildings. Uh, and that, of course, was taken by the Germans, but, uh, but was then taken back. Um, at the time of these great sieges, had... Moscow fallen, then, um, then anything could have happened. But the fact is that the Germans and the Japanese effectively fought two completely separate wars. Uh, they just happened to be happening at the same time. The, um, they didn't help each other, they didn't coordinate, they didn't, uh, they didn't even exchange um, information about anti-tank weaponry. Um, and uh, this was, again, can very largely be put down to the fact that uh, although in 1937, when the Japanese entered the Anti-Comintern Pact, um, German scientists uh, were sent out to measure, to get Japanese skulls from German museums and to measure them with calipers and to uh, deduce from this that actually the Japanese were an Aryan people. Uh, it was nonetheless um, not something that was believed by anybody in the Nazi hierarchy. And, uh, and so, uh, fortunately, certainly for the British in the Indian Ocean, there was no effective uh, interaction between the, uh, the two most powerful Axis powers. Um, one thinks, of course, also at the time of the, um, of the uh, middle part of the Second World War, 
of the amazing decision by Hitler to, um, and indeed in many ways the classic decision of him placing his fanatical Nazism before the best interests of the Reich, um, of his decision to undertake the Holocaust at the time he did and in the way he did. Whilst between 1939 and 1945, the number of um, people working in German war production factories fell, one might say collapsed, uh, from 39 million to 29 million, a drop of 26%. Now, at that exact time, Hitler decided to kill 6 million of his most intelligent, hardworking, and well-educated um, people. Uh, it made absolutely no sense whatsoever in military terms, in strategic terms, in, in, uh, in the, the terms of uh, war production, but it meant everything to him because that ultimately was what uh, the war was about for him. I, um, and, and, and in the course of that, of course, uh, he ensured, in, in the course of his anti-Semitic um, uh, actions, which of course had taken place since before he became Fuhrer, but certainly uh, after he became Fuhrer in January 1933, um, one of the classic uh, and most important aspects of that was that he lost all of the scientists, not just the Jewish scientists, but, uh, but uh, liberal-minded men who uh, ultimately were to come here to Los Alamos uh, um, and, uh, and create the nuclear bomb, which did, after all, end the Second World War. Um, and when, uh, when one thinks of, when one goes down the list of the names uh, that, uh, of people that Robert Oppenheimer brought together at, um, in New Mexico, one sees again and again these, uh, these brilliant men, um, many, many of them, uh, most of them indeed, uh, refugees from Europe. Between 1901 and 1932, the number of people who were awarded Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry in um, Germany was 16, and in uh, America it was only five. Between 1950 and the year 2000, the people who won those Nobel Prizes were in Germany, seven, and in America, 67. That is the size of the massive brain drain that took place as a result of Nazi um, ideology. I once uh, interviewed, in the course of uh, writing my first book about 20 years ago, I once interviewed uh, uh, General Surian Jacob, who was the military secretary to uh, Winston Churchill, and sorry, the assistant military secretary to Winston Churchill. And I said to him uh, at the end of, uh, of, of lunch, uh, so, um, so why, why ultimately do you think the, uh, that we won the war rather than the Germans? Because he explained quite how the Germans could have. And he said, you know, it always comes back, for me, to the, the fact that um, our German scientists were cleverer than their German scientists. <laughs> To conclude, um, I'd like to take you back to the um, Berkhof again, where uh, on the 4th of February 1942, Adolf Hitler was entertaining Heinrich Himmler um, again. And the conversation rather weirdly got round to Shakespeare. It was probably Hamlet and King Lear to which the Fuhrer was referring when he said that it was a misfortune that none of our great writers took his subject from German imperial history. Our Schiller found nothing better to do than to glorify a Swiss crossbowman. The English, for their part, had a Shakespeare, but the history of his country had supplied Shakespeare, as far as heroes are concerned, only with imbeciles and madmen. The assumption that uh, Hitler was either an imbecile or a madman is wrong. Hitler had quite a high IQ, um, it is thought. He had, uh, he, was, he was rather like, I don't know if you have the same expression in America, but rather like a train spotter, uh, in that he would be, he was a great expert on the gauges of railways, 
on the speed of tanks, on the displacement of ships and the, uh, and the um, fuel capacity of, um, of planes and so on. Uh, when it came to the, uh, the nitty-gritty details of numbers and, uh, and details like that, um, uh, Hitler was a mine of information. Um, nor was he, if he, he wasn't an imbecile, and, and he wasn't mad until the uh, point towards the very end of the war, say March or February, historians will disagree, when he was certainly going to lose and certainly going to die. Then, of course, um, the, uh, the ranting became, uh, became um, uh, well, we've all seen that magnificent Bruno Gantz movie, Downfall, uh, which, uh, which uh, captures him as well as any historian can. Uh, and all historians of, of, uh, of Hitler, uh, when that movie came out, said this, was, this is the closest we're going to get to an accurate portrayal of, uh, of the man. Um, and so when one looks at, um, at this uh, um, creature, one doesn't assume that he was either an, an imbecile or a madman. No, what he was was something different. And it was the reason that he lost the war. He was an indefatigable, unregenerative Nazi. Thank you very much indeed.